Welcome to Common Grounds, a connect group of Sagemont Church, Houston, Texas. We thank you for joining us for Falling Like a Fire, How Revival Caught History Ablaze. We hope you enjoy today's lesson. All right, so we're looking at John the Baptist, and today we're going to focus on revival preaching. Revival preaching. Now, I don't think I'm going to do this complete justice today because I, I haven't studied revival preaching like I really want to. Uh, this is going to be a, a process for me as I study how these people talk to people because uh, there's two things about revival preaching that's different from normal preaching. Um, revival preaching has power that normal preaching doesn't have, but it also has content that normal preaching doesn't have. So I'm trying to study both in my personal time. What's the difference between just a normal sermon you hear on Sunday that everybody listens to? They get something out of it. It's a good message, but one that sparks revival. And as I study, I found that there really is a difference in the power of that message, the anointing of it, the Spirit's presence there, but also the content of it. The revival preachers, our preachers today, myself included, don't really preach like the content of Jesus and John the Baptist and other things. It's just different. And studying that is, is going to be a process for me. So pray for me as I study that and learn that because it's also how we need to talk to people as well. There's, there's a difference. We're different than they are. And we want to learn a more biblical way of talking to people and sharing the Word of God. So a couple of characteristics of revival preaching is, um, number one, it has a greater sense of of the holiness of God. Revival preachers, people that bring awakenings, they have a strong sense of the holiness of God, the fear of God, and it goes right along with it, the sinfulness of people. They see their own sin. Whitfield would say, I am the chief of sinners. I am a wreck. And he's thinking, you're George Whitfield. I mean, you probably don't even sin hardly at all. I mean, you preach six, seven times a day. Thousands of people come to know the Lord through you. But they have a sense of the holiness of God, how holy He is, how pure He is. And they have a greater sense than we do in many ways of God's holiness and in the sinfulness of us, of human beings, of people. So God is more holy than we realize, and we are much more sinful than we recognize. And when God draws near to you and you start to pray for revival in your own life, you're going to start to see that. One of the things you're going to see, and it shouldn't shock you, when God starts to bring revival to your life is you're going to say, oh man, I am more messed up than I thought. I'm a wreck. I'm a sinner. And then it's often when revival comes, people in revivals cry out for mercy to God because they feel and see their sinfulness and they feel helpless to change their sin. They're like, I'm, I'm just so judgmental. I, I can't control this lust or whatever. It's just been part of me for so long. There's nothing I can do. I'm, I'm desperate, God. You're holy and I'm sinful and I don't feel like I can even change this. And it's that desperation that God breaks through and cleanses and brings revival. But you have to come to that point where you realize how sinful you are and how holy he is. He is. And it's tough. Listen, awakenings are tough. They're great. They're joyful. But they're not easy because there is a process of breaking of, I mean, it's a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. He is a holy God. He will discipline us. He will correct us. And you want God to work in your life. He's going to take you through trials and suffering. And he's going to bring things to the surface that you thought were okay. You're going to see your own sin in ways that you didn't even know that was a sin. It, you just have to work through all this. And it's good. It's great. I mean, it's like spiritual surgery. Surgery is always painful. I've never had a surgery that wasn't painful. When they cut open your skin, it's painful. And when they cut open your spiritual skin and the Lord starts to do that in your heart as well, it's painful at times. But the end product is wonderful. It's more freeing, more joyful, all the things that come from being closer to God. So we've been looking at John the Baptist, and we looked at how John the Baptist went into the wilderness, and he lived in the wilderness, and he was out there with the Lord. And John in the wilderness had a much better insight into the holiness of God and the sinfulness of culture. So he would go away from the town, away from the culture, spend time with the Lord in the wilderness, just be there. And I, I think every time he came back, with John having the Holy Spirit and nobody in the town having the Holy Spirit, every time he came back, he would just get more probably shocked at how sinful people were and how people treated each other and talked to each other and the way they thought and it had to grieve him so time alone with god will take away your taste for the world listen 
a lot of us have hobbies. There's nothing wrong with our hobbies and the things we like to do for fun. But I found the closer I get to God, the less I want to watch the Astros or the less I want to watch sports you know, or the less I want to do things that I, I don't enjoy doing too many things, but I, I just, I don't even want to play golf. I, I would rather spend time with the Lord, be with the Lord, read his word, and these hobbies sometimes in your life might fade away. Not that, not that they're inherently sinful, but as you spend time with the Lord and come into his presence and God starts to bring revival to your life, you're like, uh, you know, four hours on the golf course of getting mad and being hot and, you know, struggling with the, my emotions and hitting the, whacking the ball around. And, do I want to do that? Or would I rather sit here and read the Word and worship? But I'd rather talk to the Lord, rather be with Him. So sometimes those things fade away in your life. Even people might fade away in your life. You might be spending a whole lot of time with someone, but it's like, I, you know, I, I, yeah, they're my buddy and all that, but... I need to spend more time with the Lord, and I'd almost rather be alone with Jesus than be with my friend. And that kind of thing is what happens when you have revival. Revival comes in your life, you start to, the world starts to fade away. Look, one thing that really shocks me about revival preaching is just how blunt they are with people. But they're not rude. So what did John call the Pharisees and Sadducees when they came out to hear him preach? What did he call them? A brood of vipers. You're a brood of vipers. You're a family of snakes coming out here to hear me. Well, when you study someone, you study the scriptures, remember there's four gospels. So when you study something, don't just study something in one gospel. Look at the other gospel as well and see how that adds additional insight. So there's a reason why the Lord has it in two different books, right? There's two different writers, two different perspectives. They're both true. Now, when I was studying Matthew 3, and Matthew said, John saw the Pharisees and Sadducees and called them a brood of vipers. But in Luke chapter 3, verse 7, it says, when he saw the crowds. So he wasn't just calling the Pharisees a brood of vipers. He was calling the crowds, too. Calling them all brood of vipers. Interesting, right? And also, uh, you know, the Roman soldiers asked him, what should we do? Remember that? The Roman soldiers said, what should we do? There were Roman soldiers there he was calling a brood of vipers. You got some guts when you're, you're calling Roman soldiers a brood of vipers. Do you think John had a fear of man at all in his heart? No. And that's one thing we're praying about in evangelism. Lord, take away our fear of man because the more we fear you and the more you spend time with God, the less you will fear people. Ask the Lord to let you see the fear of man in your life. You know, a lot of our worries and our anxieties come from the fear of man. We're afraid of what people think about us. Afraid we might offend our boss. Afraid we might do this. Afraid of this. Afraid of criticism. Afraid of whatever. And a lot of it, the root of it is the fear of man. And as the Lord has been working in my life, he's been sort of exposing some of these things in my life. Like, you're afraid right now of man. You're afraid of your principal, you're afraid of this, you're afraid of this, these kids, or you're afraid of a parent. Or you're, this fear of man is deep in you, and it's, it's actually not healthy for you. You don't need to fear man. They might say something, but you don't need to fear that. You don't need to be worried and anxious about people. So when you call a Gentile Roman soldier and the crowds a brood of vipers, and they can take it, wow, that's something else. He's not saying this in anger or in judgment. He's speaking the truth. He's trying to wake these people up. He's trying to let them see who they are. Someone once said, sheep bite. Any pastor will tell you that. I want to, I want to propose something different to you. Do you know Jesus called us evil, right? Several times. Would you admit that even though you're a Christian, you still are evil until the Lord uh, sanctifies you completely in heaven and the Lord he finishes our salvation, right? Mm -hmm. So maybe it's not the sheep that bites. Maybe we're really snakes. We're sanctified snakes. We're saved. But isn't there a snake inside of you that can sometimes bite? Even the people you love, they bite you. I'm going to bite back. That's that snake. So you don't have a snake living inside of you. According to John and according to Jesus, you are a snake. Sometimes it's that flesh. It's living inside of you. It's still there. Still got to deal with it. Boy, you don't want to rip somebody, a new one sometimes, right? So it's the way we are as humans, y'all. My mom said something the other day that really helped me. She's like, there's only one Jesus. There's only one perfect person. Quit trying to be perfect. Jesus is perfect. Don't kick yourself around. Don't beat yourself up. We preach Christ. We don't preach ourselves. We preach Christ. 
can I sin Friday afternoon and go out and share the gospel Friday night? Yeah, of course. I'm going to sin every day. I mean, I'm not going to hinder that from preaching Christ. I'm preaching Christ. I'm not preaching my own goodness. I'm preaching Christ. I'm sharing with people, yeah, I struggle too. I'm, I'm human just like you. So if you want spiritual awakening, you're going to be exposed to two things. Your sins, specific sins that maybe you even know you're committing, and you've got to be willing to let the Lord do that. And then also your sinfulness, just as a person. It's like, I am a sinner. And just that's just what I do. Lord, Jesus, have mercy on me. Come into me. What is the difference between us and a lost person or some person who's a Christian, but they still got a lot of issues. What's the real difference? Isn't it just Christ in us? Isn't it just Him? It's not us. It's not anything we do. So in revival preaching, these revival preachers, they expose sin. And they don't do it in a judgmental, condemning way like you see some of these street preachers today doing. They do it in, a, they do it in love. They do it because they want to expose what it is. I was reading just the other day in my Bible reading that I do, I encourage you to at least read a chapter of the Bible a day, at least. Just, it helps your mind just to focus and just to go through. And sometimes my mind races, and actually reading the Word will actually help my mind to kind of calm down and help me focus. And sometimes I struggle through the first chapter. I try to read three a day if I can. I just struggle because my mind is just racing got so much going on and, it, and I can't focus on the words, but after a couple chapters, it'll calm down and it's just good to have the Lord speak to you through his word. So I encourage you to read at least a chapter a day, maybe two or three. Don't make it a legalistic thing that you kick yourself around on, but try to do that. Try to do that first and spend some time with the Lord and make that a spiritual discipline to be a student of the word. So I was reading about Jesus the other day and thinking about revival preaching and how they talk to people. And as I was reading, this passage, you know how when you read things, you see things you've never saw before, and God just shows you things. So I'm thinking about revival preaching and how it's different from what, how we talk to people and things like that. And so this Pharisee asked Jesus to his house for dinner. The Pharisee asked Jesus to his house for dinner. Jesus reclines at the table. And the first thing Jesus says is that he was, the Pharisee was shocked that Jesus didn't do the ceremonial washing. Instead. And Jesus said, now you Pharisees clean the outside, but inside you're full of greed and wickedness. This is the man that just invited you over to his house for dinner. Is he being rude? No. He's revival preaching. He's revival talking. He's telling the truth. Does our society need to hear the truth in love? Yes. And then he just went on, and Jesus went on. And to us, it was like blasting them. It made them mad. Well, one of the lawyers sitting there said, uh, Rabbi, when you say these things, you insult us also. And then he went off on them. Not in an angry way. He said, you've taken away the key to knowledge. You, you load people down with heavy burdens and you won't even lift a finger to help them. This is when a man asked him over to his house for dinner. Is Jesus, the Son of God, rude, disrespectful, judgmental? No. This is revival preaching. Calling sin, sin. You know, speaking to the heart. Saying, this is who you are. These men were going to hell. He's got to wake them up. Revival preaching wakes people up. And somehow when revival is going on, people, not everyone will receive it, but people will receive it that want to be revived. Also, in revival preaching, there's an increased awareness of the presence of God. So it's just not the content. There is a power there. When John went out to preach, I believe there was a power of the Holy Spirit. He was anointed and filled with the Spirit. And uh, there was a conviction in people. There was something they never felt before. Not just that they hadn't heard before, but they hadn't felt it before. And that's Whitfield. And that's Wesley. And that's a lot of these revival preachers. When they went out, people said they felt the presence of God. When George Whitfield went to Jonathan Edwards Church to preach in the First Great Awakening, Edwards sat on the front row and wept the entire sermon. Just tears just pouring down his face. And Edwards is not a real emotional guy, but just tears pouring down his face as this man preached. And his, his wife, Jonathan Edwards' wife, Sarah, said, I have never heard preaching like that. And her husband was Jonathan Edwards, one of the greatest pastors of all time. There was an anointing there. There was a power there that made this pastor just sit and weep the entire time. I, did, I remember one time I was preaching and Pastors go through a lot. I preached Sunday morning on a Sunday night. The pastor had been out of town. I didn't know. I'd never even met him. The church had just asked me to come preach. And he snuck in the back while I was 
preaching and, and the sermon is set down and I notice while I'm preaching this guy just crying at the back, just crying. I was revival preaching in a way. I was telling them what I felt the Lord told me to say that you're dead and you're, you, know, you need to be wakened up. And he was just crying the whole time. Just tears pouring down his cheeks. And then afterward, he came up and he introduced himself to me as a pastor. I was like, man, God was doing something in that man's heart, just comforting him. All he'd been through was dealing with those people. And just pastors have a hard time. They really do, especially today. It's, I mean, I don't know a pastor that's not under attack. And here's the crazy thing, y'all, we need to pray for. Satan is attacking a pastors through their church, through their own Christians. Satan is using Christians all over to attack pastors. That's a, We're in a sad state. You don't think we need awakening and revival? You don't think we got some dead churches? You know, our ministers, who we should be praying for and loving and defending with our lives, bearing their armor, are getting assaulted by Christians, deacons. Some of them aren't saved, but some of them are. They just let that snake come out more and more. They've been a snake their whole life so long. It's tough. We need to pray for our pastors. They go through a lot, and they have, and a lot of them have to deal with bitterness and forgiveness because when someone's just assaulting you Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, and you still got to love them and forgive them, it's hard. It's difficult. I talk to them a lot. Remember John Toller? He was a revival leader, and somebody came to him. Uh, Nicholas came to him. Nicholas of Basil came to him and said, you're not practicing your Pharisee. You don't practice what you preach. Toller went away for two years. Didn't preach for two years. Just went away and spent time with the Lord and let the Lord work on him, refresh him, renew him, sabbatical type thing. And when Toller came back, he was a revival preacher. How did that happen? How did he get that power? From doing ministry and being busy all the time? No, he got that power from going away and being with the Lord. We've got to let our leaders take sabbaticals. We've got to let them go. You know, when they go on vacation, where are they going now? You know, let them go. Let them go be with the Lord. I was thinking the other day, and this is something I want to do in my future, future ministry, is I was thinking the other day how much fun youth camp is. Have you ever been to youth camp? Man, if you get to go to children's youth camp, go. Go. Just for yourself, if nothing else. Just for yourself. When I went to youth camp, I, I went, as, I mean, as adult, as a leader, I went to get near Jesus. That's the number one reason I went. I'm not going to say I went just to minister to the kids and be with the kids. I did, and I did that. But I wanted to go to camp to seek the Lord. When I organized you things at a previous church I was at, I wanted to go to that conference because I wanted to get close to the Lord. I said, hey, I want to go to this conference, and I'm going to get close to the Lord. Y'all want to come along? And we, it was fun to get kids going and things like that. But so there's something about taking some time away from the world, from your life, and seeking the Lord. And we're studying Firefall. You know how the second great awakening broke out? camp meetings not just for youth see we just do it for youth now the youth get all these blessings of camp and going and and being worshiping every day and just having everything taken care of except you just focusing on god it's kind of like a christian cruise right but the food's not as good <laughs> why is youth camp so much fun for these kids because they're focused on the lord all week. they're loving each other they're spending time together they're playing some games but that's not the point. That's not what they're getting out of. I'm telling you, they're every day they're around people that love them. It's a little taste of heaven. People that care for them and love them and they're worshiping God at night and they're repenting of sins and they're confessing sin and they're getting close to God. It's a little taste of what heaven's going to be like. Youth camp. I loved it as a leader. Well, why don't we do that for adults? I've worked for one one time. It was called a Christian businessman's camp. They had the adults in one place, junior high kids in another place, and the high school kids in another place. And I led the high school group. And the adults got to go to camp. The adults got to spend the whole week focusing on the Lord. What would be better for you spiritually? Lying on a beach somewhere in Cancun or at a camp seeking the Lord? You know, you're going to lie on the beach and drink an alcoholic drink. Is that going to be best for you? Spiritually, or maybe going off to a camp meeting, spending a week seeking the Lord. Is that going to refresh you more? Is that going to heal you more? Is that going to work anymore? So one thing I would do in my future ministry is adult youth camps. Let's get the adults. Take your vacation and go spend. That's, that's what they did in the Second Great Awakening. That was a vehicle they used. That's how the Second Great Awakening broke out. They would go to these camp meetings, and they would just, once the crops came in, they would all just gather in a location and spend the whole week, bring their belongings, spend the whole week seeking the Lord, praying the Lord. And once they went, let's do it again next year. 
One of them had several thousand, like 20, 30,000 people at it in Kentucky. It was a big epicenter of the Great Awakening. God uses Kentucky somehow. Asbury and camp meetings and things like that. Don't know why. You can do whatever he wants, but pray about it. Think about it. Paul said when he went to the Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians 2, he said, I came to you in weakness and fear and much trembling. What, Paul? Weakness and fear and much trembling? He said, so that when I talked, there would be a demonstration of two things, the Spirit and the power of God, so that your faith would not rest in me. And men, you wouldn't walk away saying, oh, Paul is amazing. He's an amazing preacher. We shouldn't want that as preachers and teachers. We want people to walk away like they did from Paul that, that time in Corinth and say, God is powerful. Demonstration of the Spirit and power, that is revival preaching. And sometimes to have that, you've got to have weakness. You've got to be weak so the Lord can be strong through you. So listen to this. One reason... Why we do not have revival now is because we don't have revival preaching. It takes revival preaching sometimes to have revival. So what do we need to pray for? We need to pray for our ministers. We need to pray for God to send us revival preachers. I want to be one. I'm just telling you, honestly, that's what I want to be. Not for my glory, but I want to bring revival. Okay? Is that a bad goal or is that a good goal? We need a lot of revival preachers, don't we? We need them all over. We need to pray that God raises people up. Give us a Whitfield. Give us a Wesley. Sometimes we focus on this one person. There are a lot of other people involved, too, that were preaching in revivals. First Great Awakening, Second Great Awakening. Lots of men were on fire going out and preaching the gospel, going to people, bringing awakening to churches, waking the church up, reaching the lost. All right, let's read a little scripture. Ready? Matthew 3, 1 through 12. Let's read it again. Then those days... John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This is good news. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now John wore a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region around the Jordan were going out to him, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Stop right there. This is a confessional revival. You know, there's always repentance in revival, right? That's what revival is. It's repentance. I was involved in a confessional revival at seminary. So revival broke out at Howard Payne. The pastor of one of the churches there, when God broke out and brought revival to the campus and to his church, it actually started in his church on Sunday morning. And then it actually happened in a lot of churches simultaneously that morning, which was amazing. He came to seminary to speak. Some friends and I have been praying for revival all year at seminary. In the spring it came. God answered us. So this guy spoke. When he spoke, they opened the mic. Seminary guys, in training for seminary, you know, we're sinners too, right? We struggle with the same things you do. They got up all day long from the 10 o'clock meeting. We didn't have classes that day from 10 o'clock on. Revival broke out in the chapel. The Bible breaks out a bunch of ministers. They want to be there. And one by one, these men, training for ministry, myself included, I took my turn at the mic too, got up and confessed their sin to the whole chapel. That's what they're doing here, John. They're confessing their sin. Now, that scares us sometimes. I don't want to confess my sin to people. When you're so miserable in your sin and you want it out, you don't care anymore. They're going to John confessing their sin. I mean, guys were getting up, they're training for ministry and talking about their struggle with pornography or talking about all this stuff. And then as soon as they get down, people just rush over and pray for them, lay hands on them. God trained these guys and blessed them and cleansed them and sent them out for ministry. I have a friend at work who was at Howard Payne when that revival broke out. He said, we also had one my freshman year. I didn't know that. He said, my freshman year, he said, you know how to, you know how to go to youth camp and everybody's all fired along. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he said, well, my whole freshman year was like a youth camp, the whole first semester. I'm like, what? A whole semester of revival? He said, yeah, my freshman year, we had revival all semester long. You'd walk around and there'd be groups of kids praying over here and people praying over here and just the chapel services and everything was just, it was like a semester long revival. Don't you want that? That's what revival is. Jonathan Edwards said, the people in my town didn't want to talk anything about except the things of religion. They didn't talk to, about anything except God for like months. Months. Not a week-long revival meeting. Months. Revivals can last as long as God wants them to. Months? A year? Two years? Oh, I'd love to have been at that school and have a semester-long revival. But you know what? 
you can have it. Is this the will of God for Sagemont? Is this the will of God for you to experience a month-long revival, a semester-long revival? Some awakenings last 20 to 30 years. That's what I'm praying for. I'm praying for a 30-year awakening that just spreads and spreads and spreads and spreads, confessing their sins. There's a conviction that comes. Now, finally, I'll close with this. Often in revival preaching, they talk about the wrath of God. Now, I said before, and I'll say it again, let's not ever joke about hell. It's not a joke. The fact that we can joke about hell shows that we need revival in our own life. Because right now, there are millions of people suffering in hell. And right now, all around us are millions of people who are headed there. And we should care about that. Revival preachers see it. We don't see it. We don't think about it. They see it, and they care about it. They care about these people. When you get a personal awakening, you start to care. It starts to become a priority for you. So let's talk about the wrath of God a little bit. Unbelievers don't like to think about the wrath of God, but neither do we as Christians. We're not going to experience it, right? But they are, and we have the key to get them out, to spare them, right? Paul said, woe is me if I don't preach the gospel. So some of our family and friends co-workers are going there. And if we have an, any amount of love for them at all, we should not want that. God doesn't want that. So let's talk about the wrath of God because uh, I got seven things here about the wrath of God. And uh, you know, one of the most famous sermons in American history was in the First Great Awakening. and It was called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And Jonathan Edwards described hell. He described where these people were heading if they didn't repent. I listened to it. It's not condemning. It's not judgmental. He wasn't thundering at them. He was describing, this is where you are, this is where you're headed, and this is what's going to happen to you. And it woke him up. A lot of people got saved, and the revival broke out. They were clinging to the pews in front of them with the fear of God. So the wrath of God, first of all, is an expression of His holiness. We don't understand hell completely because we are not as holy as God is. God's holiness, expression of His holiness, is hell. Number two, hell expresses the justice of God. Hell is fair and well-deserved. We would say, you know, you know, not torture for all eternity. Tone it down a little bit. Give him a little break. You know, we would do that. God doesn't. We're not holy like he is. His wrath is an expression of his character. It's an expression of his character. He hates sin. And if you're going to carry sin inside of you, and you're never going to want to give it up, you're not going to want to be born again, then there is a wrath of God that's poured out upon you because you want to hold on to your sin. We as Christians don't. want. We, write it, we want it out of our, our life, and it will be out. Unbelievers, they're not willing to repent. And C.S. Lewis used to say the reason why uh, an unbeliever can't go to heaven is they wouldn't like it anyway. They wouldn't like it. It would be hell to them because they would go like the devil who was, got kicked out of heaven. He didn't like it. He didn't like the authority. He didn't like God's rules. I tell people, if you don't like God's rules here, you won't like him in heaven either. If you don't like him here, you won't like him there. It's an expression of his character. Men ignore it. Number four, men ignore it and disregard it. Even Christians. We ignore the wrath of God. We don't think, like to think about it. So do unbelievers. They ignore it. They disregard it. They get it out of their mind. But just because we ignore it and disregard it doesn't mean it's not real. doesn't mean that right now people are suffering incredible agony. Even though we don't like to think about it, they are. The wrath of God, hell, is an agony. It's an agony. We don't even like to talk about it. Some of you listening right now may even like, may, may, may make you uncomfortable. It's an agony, but we need to think about it, right? This is a real place. It's where people are going. It's where people we love are going. So we got to wake up. Part of awakening is realizing there's a heaven and a hell. It's an agony. Remember the rich man and Lazarus? The rich man said, oh, I'm in an agony here in this flame. Just let Lazarus come and just take a dip of just a little bit of water and just put it on the end of my tongue. About this. It's the end of my tongue. So I just have a little relief somewhere in my body. People have problems with God. Because of this, they understand this wrath. How could a loving God do this? We are not God. We don't understand His holiness. We don't understand the sight of Him. The wrath of God is delayed. It's held back. He holds back His wrath because He's merciful. But just because it's held back doesn't mean that it's not coming. Because the uh, last point is it's coming. And John says it's imminent. It's here. John saw it. Revival preachers see it. They warn people. They describe it. Verse 10 says the axe is at the root of every tree. That means it's right there. That axe is right at the root of every tree, every person. Verse 12 says the, his winnowing fork is in his hand right now. It's already in his hand. Do you know 
that 150,000 people die every day in the world? Today, before today's over, 150,000 people will die. The axe is at the root of every tree. His wounding fork is already in his hand. The wrath of God is expressed every day against sin. Every day. 150,000 people a day. Shouldn't that awaken us up as Christians? Shouldn't that alarm us that we got work to do? That averages out to 4.5 million people a month will go into eternity. And probably most of those will go to hell. Majority. That adds up to 54 million people a year dying. The axe is at the root of every tree. The wounding fork is already in his hand. It's already here. The wrath of God. It's imminent. It's near. They don't have forever. They don't have time to waste. We don't have time to waste. I don't have time to waste. I got the rest of my life. I want to spend the rest of my life helping, pastoring these people, shepherding them. We think of Jesus as just a shepherd to the sheep of, of Christians, like our pastors are. They're shepherd to the sheep of Christians. That's not all a shepherd is. A shepherd goes after the lost. Jesus was a pastor to the lost. That's what my mindset needs to be. That's my calling. I am called to be a pastor to the lost. Yeah, I'm called to take care of God's people. But a good shepherd does both, right? A pastor in a community doesn't just care for his flock. He should care for the people down the street that don't go anywhere. That's a good pastor. But we get so comfortable inside of our little churches and we get ingrown. And a good shepherd goes after a pastor, goes after the loss. Our hearts need to change from self to others. Dry eyes come from a hard heart. Spurgeon said, before you're a winner of souls, you have to be a weeper of souls. The heart has to change. Our hearts need to be softened by God. And we can't do it on our own. We need God to break our hearts, soften our hearts. Let me close with Revelation 3 to the church in Laodicea. And to the angel of the church in Laodicea, right? The words of the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. I know your works. You are neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I, I am rich, I prospered, and I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. So I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may become rich, and white garments so that you may clothe yourself with and, and the shame of your nakedness and not be may not be seen, and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. I've been having eye problems. And one thing the Lord is teaching me through this is you need my eye salve, spiritual eye salve. You need to be able to see people, your your youth, your uh, the kids you're teaching, you need to, your co-workers, the people all around you, you need to see what I see. Because right now, you don't. Sometimes you do. So I'm praying, Lord, let me see them like you do. And it'll break your heart. You see little kids with depression on them, sad. You see lost people. But I want to see the way God sees. I want I saw from my spiritual eyes so that I see the world the way He does. I see heaven. I see hell. I see people hanging in the balance. I see the church asleep, and I, I, I'm able to wake them up. I want to see the things that Jesus sees. I want to see people the way he does, so I want to love them the way he does. And Jesus said, you can have that. I'll give that to you. I'll give you eye salve to anoint your eyes, and you can see what I see. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for your truth. Um, Lord, I've got so much more to learn about revival preaching and how, how that works out. Uh, I'm not bold like you are, um, but I thank you for showing me things through your word. Help us, Lord, to speak the truth in love. Help us to, we're not all preachers, but help us to speak the truth, Lord. Help us to speak the gospel. Help us to speak in love. Help us to call things what they are. Help us to awaken people. We need you to move, God. We need revival. We need awakening. Thank you for the things you're already doing. But it's so easy for us to fall asleep, Lord. There's so many people around us are asleep. And in some ways, the church is asleep. We need you to waken us up to the reality of hell, where these people are going. We don't need to be judging them on Facebook. It's not about politics. It's about good versus evil. It's about spiritual warfare. 
Lord, help us to see people through your eyes. Help us to love the lost, Lord, even those who hate us, despise us. Maybe they've never met a Christian. Maybe they've never had someone love them. Maybe all the Christians they see online are just hateful. God, help us to represent you well. Help us to love people. Pray for the people we talked to Friday night, that you would work in their lives, God. We just don't want to be happy that we're becoming better witnesses, Lord. We want to see people saved, Lord. We want to see somebody born again, Lord. We want people to come to know you. And I know you're using us, and I know many of them will in time. So keep sending out workers into the harvest field. Thank you for hearing our prayers for that. Prepare us. Lord God, wake us up. Keep us awake. Don't let us fall asleep. So many people need you. Thank you that we're going to heaven. I thank you for that, Lord. But while we're here, give us a clear sense of purpose, Lord. Give us a clear sense of why we're still here. It's not to work or to accumulate money or to have a house or do any these things. It's not the reason why we're still here. We're here to serve you, to take care of your sheep, to take care of your people, and to go after lost people too, the lost sheep. God, we, may we care as much about the lost as we care about one another. God, if we would do that, we'd have revival. I know it, because that is revival. So thank you for what you're doing in our hearts. Continue to teach us and grow us. Thank you for how you're leading us. And help us, Lord, to, um, to just repent. Help us to see areas where we need to change. Where we need to maybe even ask someone for forgiveness or just change the way we live, change the way we act, change the way we speak. Lord, we don't want to be outside of your will. We want to be instruments of revival, instruments of awakening in people's lives. Thank you for this morning, Lord. Bless us as we share, as we talk, as we go to worship. Um, speak to us through uh, the minister who speaks, Lord. Give us ears to hear. Help us to worship you, Lord, in spirit and in truth. Help us to focus on you. Help us to not be distracted, Lord. And then help us to continue to worship you throughout the week. Help us not to leave you here at church and then just go off and get busy. Help us to keep seeking you, keep seeking your face, because that's life. Life is in you, Lord. Life is in you. And I pray for those who are struggling in this room, that you would just bless them and comfort them and strengthen them and help them to persevere, Lord, because it's going to be all right. You, you, you take care of us. Help us to trust you. So bless them and minister to them. Comfort them, Lord God. And just thank you for your truth, for your word. Thank you for these great men who you use for your glory. Thank you for what they're willing to suffer for you, even die for you or go to prison for you. Um, and help us to be willing to do the same, Lord God. And whatever the cost, Lord, help us to be willing to uh, do your will, whatever the cost, Lord. And thank you for the joy of serving you, the joy of your Holy Spirit, the joy of being filled with uh, the knowledge that we just did your will. And that you, we did something eternal. And that you're going to bless us eternally. And that we're leading people into your kingdom. What a blessing, Lord God. So give us boldness. Give us, help us to share tracts this week. Help us to pray for people this week. Help us to minister to people this week. Help us to be a shepherd, a pastor to lost people this week, Lord. Help them see the love of Christ in us. Thank you for this class. Thank you for the people in it. They're so precious, Lord, to you and to me. Uh, help our love for each other to grow. Help us to love you more and one another more and build each other up. Just bless our lunch time today as we share and talk, and may may you just be um, the center of what we do here, the center of everything. Thank you for Stephen and Sarah for their vision, for their heart, for their love for us, for their leadership. Continue to bless them and give them wisdom and vision, Lord. Um, show them, Lord God, the direction we need to go, and bless their hearts. Bless their hearts with uh, pastors' hearts, Lord God, with shepherds' hearts, Lord. Just thank you for uh, today. Thank you for your word. Thank you for truth. Thank you for these men who sparked awakening in history. Lord, may we spark it in our time, in our words, in our conversations, in our prayers. And maybe we, may we be willing, Lord, to let you wreck us. Wreck us so that you can rebuild us. Help us, Lord. It's tough. It's tough. It's been a tough week. Help us to let you wreck our lives so that you can rebuild it for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for listening. If this week's message helped you, feel free to share it with a friend. At Common Grounds, we are striving to help people grow in their faith and build community by finding common ground in Christ Jesus. Until next time, hope you all have a great week.